Hello, everyone. Welcome to another weekly Bible study. We are continuing on in our study through Philippians. And so today we are in Philippians chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 9. If you have your Bible there beside you, go ahead and turn to Philippians chapter 4. If you're using an electronic Bible, then just scroll on over to Philippians 4. Today we're going to be studying joy through peace. We're continuing on in our study through the, uh, the different pillars of peace that are presented throughout the book of Philippians. So today as we think about joy through peace, imagine two scenes. The first is a scene of a mountain lake far away from all the hustle and bustle of daily life. The motionless water there acts like a mirror reflecting the beauty and the quiet of the moment. And also in the second scene, imagine this, a bird calmly sitting on her nest built in a small opening in a rock. Her nest is hidden by a raging waterfall with a storm approaching in the horizon. Though both scenes are very different, we still find peace in both scenes. This is a reminder to us that God is present in both the still moments of life and the storms of life as well. As our focal passage reminds us today, Paul reminds the Philippians that peace is found in God's presence regardless of of the circumstances of life. So let's talk this morning about the context. Rejoicing is a key theme of Philippians. Having studied through the first three chapters of Philippians so far, we have given attention to this theme of joy, these pillars of joy that run throughout these chapters. In the opening verses of chapter one, attention has been drawn to joy that was experienced through prayer. In the second half of the opening chapter, we looked at how joy can be found even in the midst of adversity. In the second chapter, emphasis was given to the role that humility can play in experiencing joy. And in the third chapter, we, got, we, we received the story of the very basic truth that there is joy simply in knowing Jesus. This week's study focuses on experiencing joy and peace through our relationship with Christ, even though outward circumstances might be in turmoil. In the opening verse of chapter 4, the Apostle Paul urged the Philippian believers to stand firm in their faith, knowing that their fellowship was composed of dearly loved friends who were also brothers and sisters in the Lord. In the next two verses of the chapter, Paul urged two dissenting members, Euodia and Syntyche, to find renewed joy by putting aside their differences. He further called on the church family, to join in helping them to recover the kind of relationship that had been theirs when they previously had worked together and with others in contending for the gospel. Renewed joy then would be theirs through being freshly united with one another in Christian love. <coughs> If you have your coffee or green tea, I encourage you to sip on it. <laughs> uh, we'll uh, we'll have our uh, coffee or tea together. I, the green tea helps me with my coughing sometimes. But so, uh, in order to to come back together, they would have this renewed joy when they came back together and were freshly united with one another. Then, turning his attention from the two disgruntled members, Paul then turns to the entire congregation with the positive appeal that they rejoice in God at all times, whether good or bad. His promise to them was that they could know a surpassing peace when approaching God through prayer 
rather than worrying about the circumstances that surrounded them at that time. That peace then would stand guard over their thoughts and their feelings and let their minds dwell on God's truth, standing over them like a soldier. Paul encourages them to set their minds on God's truth, to let their minds dwell on this and to give attention to the things that were morally excellent excellent and praiseworthy. Then he even goes a step further and presents himself as an example of dwelling on the truth, knowing from his own experience that in doing so, peace would be experienced. So now let's explore the text together. Let's look at Philippians chapter 4. We'll start with verse 1. In this section, we have the admonition, stand. Philippians 4, verse 1, stand. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. This word, therefore, translates a single term that does double duty in this passage. This connecting term can look back and can also look forward. The expression points back to the preceding verses in which the church's great hope anticipates the Lord's return. Christ's return will initiate our final and full transformation into his likeness, including a glorious body. We looked at that in chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. The implication of this future for us is that we as believers should stand firm in the Lord. The word therefore can also look forward as the lead in to the personal appeal for duty in the church and rejoicing in the Lord, both being attributes that should flow from our steadfastness in the Lord. That's given in verses two through three. Okay, so I just got a message from the stream here. Hang on just a second. And let's take a look at what it's saying about the, the frame rate here just a moment. We want it to uh, be coming through okay for you there. So it's giving me a little error about the frame rate. Okay, so let's see if that doesn't uh, help it a little bit. Hopefully everything's coming through fine for you and we can uh, continue on with this. Okay, good deal. Okay, so then this opening verse of chapter 4 expresses Paul's heart for the Philippian church. His heart was revealed in the terms of endearment that he packed into this verse when he referred to them, brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown. In referring to his Philippian friends as his joy and crown, Paul implies that they were his present joy as he received good reports about them. And in the future, when they were all in the presence of Jesus Christ at his second coming, they would also be his future crown, that is, his victorious crown, his victor's crown, when Christ rewards his faithful servants. Paul's admonition about the importance of standing firm in the Lord was typified in the way a Roman soldier would stand firm and remain in place during an assault. That kind of soldier would bring joy to his commander. This kind of spiritual steadfastness brings joy to our Lord, and that, in return, brings joy to us. Now let's look at verses 2 through 3. In this, we have the admonition to unite. Verses 2 through 3, unite in Philippians 4. Now, I'll just say a couple things about some of these names. Uh, I hail from the country, so they might not be exactly right. But uh, those of you who have taken uh, Greek, just uh, bear with me on that because I'm going to pronounce them the way I grew up pronouncing them. <laughs> so just hang right on. I plead, verse 2, with Yodia, and I please with Sentaichi to be of the same mind in the Lord. Verse 3, yes, and I ask you, my true companion, 
Help these women since they have contended at my side in the course of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. I'm glad our names are written in the book of life and that we don't have to pronounce them, but that they can be written there. Amen. <laughs> Their names are in the book of life. <clears throat> Having further knowledge about these two ladies, Yodia and Sintaichi, as well as knowing the cause of the dispute between them, we don't really know what the dispute was between them, and it's really irrelevant what this, what the cause of it was. But what is important to realize that is that the need for believers to be quick to put aside differences and unite when they find themselves at odds with one another. Repeating this phrase, I plead with each of the women, suggests seeking reconciliation was equally the responsibility of both parties. Christians belong to the same spiritual family and share equally in the responsibility to maintain harmony in that family. It's all of our responsibility to maintain harmony in the family of God, both sides of an argument. It's their responsibility. The message and ministry of a church are sorely impaired when dissension exists between members. The appeal then to be of the same mind in the Lord serves as a reminder that believers live in a joint spiritual union, a union with the Lord himself and a union with one another. To cause a breach in the union between believers robs the union with Jesus of the full measure of joy that could be flowing from this joint union. Disunity is of even greater concern when differences arise between members who have previously been faithfully and fruitfully engaged in the church's ministries. In the case of these two women at Philippi here, their prior service had been alongside Paul and others of his co-workers in contending for the gospel. They had strived together they had worked together. They had faithfully served together. And now there was a sharp argument between the two. And there was a great dissension among the two of them. And no doubt within the church that it was starting to form factions. Well, I'm on this side. Well, I'm on that side. You know how those things go. And the next thing you know, when those things go unchecked and that dissension is allowed to continue to flourish and grow, there's a phenomenon that happens that we know today as a church split. People who once strived in the gospel together part ways. Many of them go one way and many of them go another. We've seen it many, many times. So Paul's appeal to, to these two ladies, Yodia and Sintaichi, for unity was coupled with a plea for a third party. And this third party he referred to as the true companion to bring about this reconciliation. This serves as a reminder that part of our ministry in the body of Christ might on occasion be that of facilitating harmony among other believers in the church. Are you a fellow believer who facilitates harmony? Or are you a, a, a fellow believer who participates in the gospel grapevine? That's, I call it the gospel. It's the gossip grapevine. You know what I'm talking about. Are you one who, who encourages unity? Or are you one who encourages dissension and division? Paul was talking about here all the parties involved, the dissidents and the peacemakers alike. All of them were enrolled in the book of life. In other words, no divisions will be found in heaven. Aren't you glad of that? No divisions will be, glad, will be found at all in heaven. That feature of the heavenly reality that we have to look forward to in the future should also characterize the church here below. Something stands amiss when members confess to unity in heaven 
but allow disunity on the earth. It's an important thing to remember. Now let's look at the next admonition here in Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7, and that's this. Pray. Pray. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Paul's repeated appeal for rejoicing puts double emphasis on the role of joy in a believer's life as well as that of a congregation of believers. The focus of rejoicing does not lie in life's circumstances or even in material blessings. Lasting and meaningful joy is in the Lord. Our faithful and unchanging Lord makes rejoicing possible when material blessings might be lacking and circumstances are around us are unfavorable. If we focus on looking around, we may well become filled with sorrow, regret, or even anxiety. Many reasons may be found in life for, for feeling downcast, for feeling burdened, social evils, personal shortcomings, and actions of those around us may be allowed to become occasions for sorrow and stress. In addition, if we also look within, we may well become discouraged. Even at our best, we are painfully aware of inconsistencies and weaknesses within ourselves. Our hearts, they can betray us. Our longings can become lusts. Our possessions can become gods. Our lacks can become occasions for jealousy when we see someone else who has something that we think we should have or that we feel that we are entitled to. And even envy when others don't seem to lack the things that we lack. So instead of looking around and instead of looking within, if our focus is on looking up, then we can rejoice always since our Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the constant in the believer's life. Only in him can we rejoice always. Christian joy is one of the best doorways into prayer. Paul had experienced this in the Philippian jail and in his Roman imprisonment. A full heart will overflow with both praise and prayer in the Lord's presence. So here he's, when he's saying rejoice, this is an active verb. It doesn't depend on something else acting upon it. You see, it's active. It doesn't need something to act upon it for it to happen, as would be the case with a passive verb. Instead, it's an active verb, which means we can rejoice because we choose to rejoice. Paul has given us the admonition here, regardless of life circumstances, and regardless of the disappointments that may be around us or the inconsistencies that may be within us, choose to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. Now let's look at verse 5. Verse 5, let your gentleness be evident to all, and here's the trick, the Lord is near. Not only are believers to rejoice in the Lord always, we are to be gracious to everyone. Doing so may call for putting aside our own rights in order to show gentleness and consideration to others. Doing this may come easy with some people, but the expectation is that our graciousness will be evident to all. That includes those with whom graciousness is difficult. Know anybody like that? <laughs> Have anybody in your life it's hard to be gracious to? He's saying here, let your graciousness and your gentleness be evident to all, even those to whom it's difficult to extend it. The fact that the Lord is near adds to the importance of Christian graciousness. 
the Lord is near in a dual sense. By his Holy Spirit, he is consistently present with every believer. So far as we know, the return of the Lord is nearer than we might otherwise think. A prospect that was referred to even at the close of what we studied previously in chapter 3. <clears throat> a potentially powerful motivation for obedience to every commandment of Scripture is the prospect of Christ's return at any moment. Would we want him to return and find us harboring unkind or bitter thoughts toward a fellow believer? Having recently spoken harsh words to another member of God's family or st standing apart and putting ourselves above and feeling superior to a brother or sister in the Lord? <coughs> Hang with me, y'all. COPD's acted up, but we'll get through it, all right? Appreciate your prayers. As long as he gives us breath, we'll praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so we should not do that, but let our gentleness be evident to all, all believers, all unbelievers, even though those with whom it's difficult. Now let's look at verses 6 through 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's really interesting. Uh, Philippi, uh, Philippi was a military outpost. And so when Paul does uh, use his phrases and words like guard, guard your heart and your mind, that it's, it's very simple for the Philippians to be able to, to get this image of a soldier standing guard at their post. And that's kind of the, the image that we get here. The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will stand guard. It will stand guard at its post over your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What a wonderful image. To live with anxiety is to live with a thief of joy lurking in your heart. The antidote then, this, this anti-thief measure, the security measure, and the prelude to peace is the practice of thanksgiving and prayer. Paul urged his Philippian friends to pray about every situation in place of worrying about anything. Now, Paul was not advocating apathy or even inaction concerning matters about which followers of Christ should care deeply. There is a proper sense in which Christians should be concerned about many things. However, the sense of anxiety here is that of fretfulness or undue concern over matters that would be taken to the Lord in prayer. Clearly, Jesus admonished his followers to forget about fretful worry, just toss it aside over things that, that you cannot change by worrying about them. Did you know there are certain things in life that you cannot change simply by worrying about them? It's true. And Jesus even said, don't worry about your food or your clothing the length of your life, or even the height of one's body. He talked about this in Matthew 6, 25 through 31. He said, your heavenly Father knows about all these things. When matters of concern are transferred from our worrying to God's enabling, then our petitions are to be made known in combination with thanksgiving. Recollection that God has already supplied many thankworthy gifts or benefits that are added to faith when we approach to him for our current needs. God will meet our needs. To be frequently asking but seldom thanking is unbecoming for children of a loving and generous father. <coughs> thanking and petitioning form a powerful combination, a good combination at all times 
for praying. The practice of prayer, then, that incorporates both thanksgiving and petitioning comes with a significant promise that's attached to it, and that's this, the peace of God. Did you catch that? The practice of prayer with both thanksgiving and petitioning has a promise attached to it, and that's this, the peace of God. Through faith in Christ and his atoning death, we have peace with God. Through prayer, we experience the peace of God standing guard over our hearts and minds. If we associate the heart with feelings or emotions, then God's peace wards off anxiety that stems from our feelings. If we also then associate the mind with our thoughts, then God's peace wards off anxiety that's rooted in our thoughts and our imaginations. Most of us have known anxious moments that come from negative emotions and uncontrolled thoughts. But praying with thanksgiving and petitioning grants us the peace of God to guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And divine peace transcends all understanding. It is in Christ, is the phrase that he used there, in Christ Jesus, that God has chosen to administer his peace. Our faith relationship with Jesus in the context in which God's peace operates his children to guard all against all anxiety and despair. Again, when you have that relationship in Christ Jesus, that is the mechanism that God uses to guard your heart and your mind against anxiety and fear. Now let's look at the next admonition in Philippians 4, verses 8 through 9. This one is dwell. Dwell, verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. He uses a relative pronoun here that's called whatever. That's the, that's the word. And this term, this relative pronoun, whatever, introduces six virtues that possess the power to oust anxiety and replace it with divine peace if we make the decision to think about such things. In other words, what we set our minds on determines the tone of our emotional lives. What the mind is occupied with affects how we feel, whether anxious or at peace. Well, let's look at these six things that are listed here. The first one is whatever's true, he says. This, this term true points to what is valid or reliable rather than what is false, flimsy, and unreliable. The world has sold a vast amount of our society, a great number of lies today. Lies that say it'll bring you peace. Lies that say it'll bring you joy. Lies that say it'll bring you happiness. <coughs> but turning away from God's word and seeking after those things will not bring joy and happiness and peace. Instead, they will bring anxiety and turmoil because they're not true. That's the bottom line. Anxiety results when false ideas and unreal or imaginary circumstances occupy the mind. Now let's think about the second one. The second word, noble, speaks about what is worthy of respect. Majestic thoughts lift the mind above the ordinary or even the sinful things that compose the world's lusts and scandals. For example, behaviors that are tainted with sinful desires and immoral activities can enter the mind through popular movies, magazines, frequently read novels, and even billboards. The third term, right, describes behavior that is upright. 
in that it conforms to God's standards or expectations. And as such, it is right or fair to all in how it affects them. That's the way this right is understood. Such thinking or evaluating then avoids quarrels or dissensions in that it concedes the needs and rights of others before the self. That's what right means. Consider the needs and the rights of others before the self. Well, here's the fourth term, this term pure. This term pure refers to something that is chaste or moral as opposed to what is shameful and sinful. And listen, just because the world says it's okay doesn't mean that it's any less shameful or sinful according to God's word. Just keep that in mind. Don't let the morality of the world change your mind into thinking that something that has always been shameful and always been sinful is suddenly all, all of a sudden okay. It isn't. Just remember that. But thinking on pure things incline us toward God because God is holy. That's another lesson for us here. The more our society focuses on things that are ungodly, the less God's going to have anything to do with us. He's going to say, okay, you want it, you can have it. And we'll make a total mess out of it. And we're going to make a total mess out of it. Think on things that are pure, chaste, and moral. Here's the fifth one, lovely. Lovely refers to what is attractive and pleasing and so encourages the affection of others. And this results in togetherness in place of separation, fellowship instead of feuding, and peace instead of contention. Thinking on things, pondering things that are lovely. The next one he says is whatever's admirable. This is something that's worthy of admiration, approval, and praise. Admirable actions are pleasing to others and draws them closer than repulsing them. This means that our reputation before others is appealing because it is an earned reputation and it is a rightly deserved reputation because we behave in an admirable fashion. So after these six descriptive terms, Paul added two conditional clauses that call for readers to examine their own discernment about what is morally excellent and worthy of praise. So in assuming these evaluations and in carefully considering these evaluations that he's given, Paul then calls for the Philippians to let their minds dwell on these things. This dwelling on the things just written meant they should ponder them, give them due value, give the proper weight to them, and then allow this appraisal, allow this consideration to influence their manner of life. The biblical principle is that as people think in their hearts, so they tend to be in their actions. And that's so true. As a person thinks within their heart, that's the way they're going to act. Now let's look at verse 9. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Whatever you have learned or received was a reminder of the teaching ministry of Paul and others and the Philippians' response to that teaching. Furthermore, he uses the phrase, heard from me or seen in me, reminds the Philippians that they had experienced the additional advantage of seeing this faithful apostle model the very teachings he was giving them. That's a, a, another lesson, another reminder to us that clear teaching alongside living examples is always a powerful combination for commending God's truth to others. In those early days of the church, when the New Testament had not been completely written, circulated, and read, the standards for Christian belief and behavior were communicated through the teachings of the apostles and the examples they led. <coughs> those who faithfully received and followed the teaching and example of the apostles had the wonderful promise that the God of peace would be with them. 
Earlier in verse 7, Paul gave the Philippians the promise that the peace of God would be with them to guard their hearts and minds. In this present verse, Paul adds the promise that God himself, the God of peace, would be with them as they let their minds dwell on the truths they were reading in this letter. So as we wrap up today, as we think about joy through peace, one of the key doctrines that jump out at us is this. Members of New Testament churches should cooperate with one another in carrying forward the missionary, educational, and benevolent ministries for the extension of Christ's kingdom. Listen to 1 Corinthians 1.10. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. There is joy through peace, and that peace is found in God's presence regardless of the circumstances, strengthened by standing firm as a soldier of the cross, by walking in unity with other believers, by praying at all times with all kinds of prayers by pondering the right things in our hearts and minds, by praying with a heart of thanksgiving, and by living out what we have learned and received from the faithful teachings of others and the sure and certain word of God. There is joy through peace. And the peace that passes all understanding comes to us through Christ Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. Thank you so much for joining again this week. Again, I always encourage you to uh, put your any comments you may have there in the chat. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to see that uh, what insights you may have or thoughts you might want to share with everyone else in the chat. I do encourage you to do so. God bless you. Thanks for joining. I pray that he will bless this, uh, this lesson today to your heart as he has to mine, that we might carry it forth and be better children better servants, better soldiers of the cross for him. Until next week, God bless.